Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gnostic Media's Unspun, episode number 89. I'm your host, Jan Irvin, back with Bill Jocelyn tonight. Wanted to uh, say thanks first before we dive in episode number 89. I'm your host, Jan Irvin, (laughs) back with... There we go. I had to mute that. Started uh, feeding back through, but uh, I wanted to mention a few things before we dive in, Bill. Got a... uh, letter from Justin today and uh, I want to congratulate Justin first off because before he started listening to the show he weighed get this bill 569 pounds wow he's now down to his 380s and on his way down from cutting grains listening to the show getting on a high fat diet turning his health around, running for governor or mayor of his uh, small town. Oh, fantastic. But uh, he sent a letter and a little donation, wanted to congratulate him. Also, thanks to uh, Camille for sending her donation in the mail today. I appreciate that. I love getting, you know, I appreciate all the donations, but it's really nice to open the mail and get an actual handwritten letter from someone. And, you know, and this guy, you know, it's like, wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I actually received a gift from the last show as well from Jeff, some type pipe tobacco and stuff. Thank you so much. I was very touched by that. Absolutely. You know, and it means a lot because we've done, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you and I have been friends for a long time, but I almost died in the hospital in 2009. I was in the ICU for five days. Um, It was my son's third birthday when I was told that basically they didn't expect me to live through the night, but they had finally figured out what was wrong with me. You know, so uh, I went from about 111 pounds to 165 and off all the meds, off everything. But, you know, it's just getting that it's the grains that they're keeping us sick with. It's the low fat diet. Mm -hmm. eating fresh vegetables all the soy products all the beans too you know it's all of the uh plants high in in poisonous lectins but anyway welcome back thanks for having me again Uh, i was hoping to uh to get a little bit more into or or to clarify a little bit more on the 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 sheepdog democracy side uh, the political side and hopefully maybe into a little bit of the epistemology um, there were some comments that came up around uh, my talking about monopoly on violence. So I think I, I left I left uh, it unexplained uh, to the degree that people may have had some confusion about it. Um, and I think the other thing that we didn't get into very much, or I think we mentioned it a couple of times, but we didn't really explicitly talk about it, was the notion of a, con- a confederacy of, of sovereign men, that idea of everybody is sheriff. Uh, so I was hoping to go from there because I think when we initially talked about it, that was the thing that, that caught your interest as well was this notion of everybody a sheriff and the, the distribution of, uh, of judicial you know, power. Okay. So the concept stack that I use in terms of how a, how a civilization or how a society is created uh, like a formal society that has institutions and so on, was the, uh, we, we touched upon uh, upon it a little bit where it's that notion of of clearing a terrain of its violence, and to do that means that you hold a monopoly on violence. So you either kill off all the competitors or fight them all back. Nobody else can challenge you. You're the de facto guy. You're the only one that isn't beholden to anybody else because you hold the power of force. Now you can use that any number of ways. You can use that to enslave other people. You can use that to protect other people. You, you can use that uh, to uh, start building institutions and so on. So the the notion of a monopoly of violence isn't to say that sheepdog democracy is about a monopoly and violence. It's to say that it's, it's a, it's a core component of civilization. That if you're going to have uh, agreements or uh, you know rules or whatever within your your society, you need a way to enforce it. 
And the way to enforce it means that you need to have a monopoly on violence to some extent. Uh, it's, it's really a matter of what happens with that monopoly uh, once it's established. And how do you keep it in check? It keep it in check and balance. And then, and, and then that's, so the notion then is, well, if nobody, if nobody had that force, whether it's a group of people or one person or whatever, if nobody had that ability with force, then nobody else would get screwed over. But then what happens is you, now you're, you're left wide open to be screwed over by everybody. So if you have a monopoly of force that's being used for good and justice, it, it preserves the laws and, and maintains uh, sort of a clearing for high trust. Somebody's there to, to uh, enforce the law or, or, uh, or execute on remedia- remuneration when there's a conflict that happens or, or some sort of breakdown of civil order. Or you can use it to screw everybody over. And I think the, the, the big shift, well, let me back up a little bit. There's a number of ways that we move the world, how we affect the world. And, and, and this is, and I don't just mean in some sociological sense with each other. We either move it physically, literally physical force to move something. Uh, we can do it socially through agreement and cooperation, or I can, I can, uh, you know, offer you something to do something with me, and, and that affects a change in the world. And cooperate, or we can do it through information. So I can give you information or I can learn information and from that I can change the world. So think of it in those three, those three uh, broad categories. There's physical coercion of the world, social and informational. And this isn't exclusive to uh, humans. I'm actually drawing this from studies on chimpanzees and troop leaders. They can either have everybody scared of them and be the tyrant and that keeps their troop together or they can sit there and go through grooming rituals with every member in that troop and out of the bonds that he develops with the troop keeps the group cohesion. Or in the, in the one that I found humorous was this tiny little ape that figured out that tin cans made a lot of noise and he could rattle the tin cans and scare everybody else away. And he ended up being troop leader because of it. Uh, because, so he had these little, and he would, he would be a trickster. He'd come out of the bush at people and scare them away and stuff. So he was using intellect or information to, to maintain control or group cohesion. Each one of those has uh, a survival strategy behind it. So coercing the world through physical force roughly is predation. I'm going to kill you and take your stuff. Or I can, I can uh, betray a trust that we've established to, to seek resources from you or freeload to some extent. So it's parasitism. You need a host and then you can, you can slowly draw from the host as long as they tolerate it. And this, this is a way of gaining resources, gaining that asymmetrical benefit that we need to stay alive. Or you can do it through cooperation. So really what we're talking about when we're talking about a just society is that we're limiting uh, strategies, human strategies to get resources to cooperation alone. We're isolating out predation with a monopoly on violence, and we have yet to have a society that's isolated away parasitism. <laughs> that's right? for sure. And that's that's, the, that's the, 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 the big shift in the Enlightenment from monarchs to constitutional monarchy was where we really kind of got a good control over predation, where we had uh, laws that people could get behind. We had a flourishing of cooperation, but we also, out of that, out of establishing these parliaments and everything else, we set up the perfect system for parasitism. And that's what we're in right now is, is, uh, uh, a system that, uh, rewards people that, uh, can move the world through persuasion and perception, not reality, not ability. The only ability that they have that's better than anybody else's is their ability to manipulate other people. They're parasites. Uh, so when we criticize the, the state of the world and we start criticizing these things that we've worked out, like uh, 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 a separation of powers or separation of church and state, uh, checks and balances. These were all ways that we dealt with 
uh, predation and physical force to separate the police from the military and the judges from the police and so on was a, a way of dealing with the threat of tyrannical physical force, overt slavery and so on. But what we haven't dealt with is this notion of parasitism, and rent seeking within our civilizations. You know, and then it's like you have these secret society groups that form brotherhoods behind the scenes as well. Well, and that's exactly what I mean, is that we created a system that where though that sort of influence became uh, uh, became a high reward way of uh, exerting political control. Uh, if you look at a, you look at the geopolitics today and, and how most of our governments are influenced from a dark state, these were all established, you know, essentially by the Rhodes Network 100 years ago that is now accepted as, uh, as just how our governments work. So we have the, the, the notion of a lobbying group that will actually write laws and give them to a congressperson to present in parliament. Well, uh, that was never the intention of how our systems would work. Here in Canada, it's the bureaucrats. It's not so much lobbying groups, but it's bureaucrats, academia and the bureaucrats. And then the bureaucrats exert this plutonic control over the MPs. Well, it, we've, we've come so far downstream from that that we just accept it. That that's, just, that's just the way our governments work even though they're incredibly unjust because of it, you know? And it's because we, we have a system that has opened that door and reinforces that particular type of strategy, which is a strategy through parasitism, through lies and deception and, 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 and rent seeking and manipulation and reframing uh, it, that all originated with these original secret societies. This was their means of, of exerting control over the, and that would have to include things like usury, Marxism, socialism. Yeah. Um, you know, you see the the LGBT QWERTY community out there pushing this whole agenda these days. So, well, what, all, what, is, what is it they're doing? Because this will get this will get closer to the mechanism on how this operates. What they're doing is they're seeking special rights. Right. So they're they're seeking parliamentary uh, support to legislate in certain rights to give them an advantage over others. Well, what it, how, did, how is that even possible? Well, it's possible because our parliaments hold a monopoly on violence. And, there, and we have to make a distinction that the monopoly on violence is not about rulership. It's about, um, it's about conflict resolution. It's about the judiciary. It's not about uh, where, where roads are going to be built or uh, who, who gets the city contract for removing garbage. So what we've done is we've taken management of the commons, the communal property that's managed by uh, an institution that we call our government, and we've collapsed that with the rule of law. We've made them one and the same thing. So now they can use the force behind the rule of law that's there to, to, to protect high trust circumstances so that they can exert all of their strategies uh, behind it. And what we need to do is deconflate those two things and say we don't need the force of, of law to go behind the what are, are, are really just uh, basic managerial tasks. You know, what, who, what, what company's gonna get one contract and where, where budgets go, you don't need to have the, the monopoly on violence to get those things done. But well, we have them all in one hand, which, uh, and when you do that, now politicians have a product to sell. They have uh, the power to use force to execute a, a particular will. That you creates know, a product that they can then sell to special interests. And that's uh, the whole thing with affirmative action as well. It's to give other groups a, uh, you know, an advantage over everybody else. Yeah. And, and as soon as you do that, uh, as soon as you do that, the predictability behind how the law operates starts to decline. Uh, decisions start to be made on arbitrary or, or, or trivial means, which means people start to lose faith in it. And it begins the process of a breakdown on one of the core pillars of, uh, of society, which is this, this necessity for us to have an agreement on how we're going to live together and have the ability to enforce that agreement or maintain it. Uh, so 
like I said in the last show, the, the notion of equality before the law was, was how, uh, how, how is this force going to be used within the polis? Well, it has to be uh, used in a way that's, that's uh, not arbitrary, that's not trivial, it's not discretionary, it's not just somebody saying, well, I'm going to do this today and not tomorrow, where nobody can, can predict it. So the notion of equality before the law was just to say that, that there are going to be set rules on how this force is going to be used, and it, it'll apply to everybody. And then when that happens, now people know what's expected of them, they can calm down into that set of rules. Well, as soon as you start int introducing special rights, you no longer have equality before the law. You have, uh, you have this set of laws for this group of people, this set of laws for that group of people, and you're starting to slip back into this ar arbitrary discretionary rule, which breaks down trust again. It breaks down, the, essentially it breaks down our willingness to participate in a social contract. You know, so this is the, the, the notion behind negative rights versus positive rights. As soon as you define oh. a positive right, anything so, that's not... That let, me, let me give an example. Here in California, we have uh, this guy, Governor uh, Jerry Twinkle Toes Moonbeam. And uh, so he's, he was the governor of California back in the 60s, 70s. He's been the governor again. And uh, this last week, he passed a law that if you do not address the proper gender pronoun of these trans qwerty transgender people when they're in the medical system, then the uh, healthcare professionals will now go to prison. So now they are, if, if somebody is sick or ill and they're treating them and they accidentally say, excuse me, you know, sir or ma'am, uh -huh then they will go to jail for this. I mean, you know, this is the erosion of freedom of, of speech, of common sense. I mean, this is, you know, just going into the, the absurd of this. Now, you know, Governor Twinkletoes wants to control the very words we're allowed to speak. And this is only the first step in medical care. You can guarantee... Twinkle toes and these people have a whole line of this stuff ready to roll out. Well, they they, they passed uh, M103 here in Canada about this time last year, uh, and now it's being proposed as a law, which is the exact same thing. It's if you misgender somebody uh, under the motion, you could deal with fines and so on, but now under the law, it, it could be more serious consequences. Not to mention that in, in Canada, I don't think very many Canadians know what's going on in our legal system. We have social justice tribunes here and human, human rights tri uh, tribunals that are a parallel legal system to our common law si system. And uh, so under common law, you're innocent until proven guilty. The key word there being proven uh, and innocent prior to that. And uh, the tribunals operate off a thing called 50 plus one. And it's a 50 plus, 50 percent plus one probability that the victim felt some sort of injury. And that's what constitutes guilt. So it doesn't even matter if 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 you've done something or not. What matters is if the if the complainant felt that you did something wrong and uh, has suffered from it. So the and, and, but it's and, but the arbit but it's an arbitrary suffer. It's an emotional suffering that can't be looked at and examined. Well, and it includes that, and that's the issue: is that it includes things uh, like emotional distress or uh, things that are harder to quantify. Uh, and that's a, that's a serious issue. It's a serious issue. One when we start removing things like a burden of proof and lowering the criteria for. Uh, innocence or guilt. And it's also a very serious issue to have a parallel legal system going on at the same time. That, uh, uh, you know, you can throw your hands up and say, well, it's a tribunal. It's not a judge. It's not, it doesn't have the weight of law behind it. Well, it does have the weight of law behind it because if you don't, uh, if you don't abide by whatever their resolution is, then you become in contempt of that court. And then that's when the common law system steps in. So the, these are serious issues that I, I think maybe, you know, 1% of 1% of Canadians are aware of what's going on. I mean, there was, a, there was a note that was sent out last week 
uh, to the Bar Association here in Ontario that required lawyers to, to write down uh, an assessment of their social justice stance. Uh, so you, you better believe that if your social justice stance doesn't fit with the, the predominant liberal thought, uh, there's going to be ramifications for your career there. So it has a huge chilling effect on the diversity of ideas and conversation and, and the need to debate verbally when somebody's career is under threat. And then not to mention that that person's career is a critical component of a legal system that either puts criminals away or keeps you safe from state from the state, you know. And the the one area that I wasn't upset about in Canada was our our, our judges and defense attorneys to, seem to still have uh, a strong sense of the the, the principles behind uh, common law uh, held as principles. They're not just scammers in the system. And they're getting very old, especially the judges, and they're going to be retiring soon. And the people that are coming up behind them are coming right out of these social justice courses <clears throat> that at its core is trying to dismantle Western civilization and institutions of Western uh, uh, civilization and, and, and rebuild it in some sort of utopian uh, image, uh, this egalitarian image. And it's really scary. This is this isn't. We're not LARPing here when we're saying these things are really going on in the world. They have real ramifications. It's just that we're a couple of years ahead of, of normal people seeing what those ramifications are. You know. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So on that note about about justice and rule of law and that whole notion. Uh, was this notion of everybody a sheriff uh, and everybody a judge? That if we have one law, rather than 50 million laws, most of which were passed because they were a product being sold to some sort of special interest, if we have one law uh, that uh, gives us uh, a means of deciding what to do in conflict, a, a measure, a commensurable measure, decidability in that situation, we don't need an institution for law. Every person can act as a judge or a sheriff. That if you know, we all commit to upholding natural law, we can all be the enforcers of natural law and the arbitrators when conflicts come up. Yeah. I was just going to mention several years ago, I interviewed uh, Paul Schrader, who is running for sheriff of San Bernardino County. You know, and that is the essence of what the U.S. Constitution gets at with the militia, with the sheriff being the supreme law of the land, et cetera. But it's, you know, it's gotten it's gotten away from them. But, you know, the sheriff would deputize, you could deputize every male in the county. And he could draw on the local militias as well. And, and well, well, he was the head of the militias, and then he called them together for the defense. But not only that, when there was a criminal about, he called together the posse out of mm -hmm. the militia. You know, but the whole, the trust relationship between the militia and the posse and the sheriff has been eroded away. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that, that you've, you've had a number of centralizations of those institutions. Uh, uh, last week, I can't remember who it was, had passed around some videos about the constitutional mil uh, militia and, the, and sort of the original documents behind the notion of a militia in the United States, which was fascinating. It, it was quite literally the only legitimate institution was the militia. The rest were secondary to it. Right. But, you know, just and, 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 you know, so what the, you know, the media for the last 40, 50 years is spent a campaign of ridiculing the militia mm -hmm. rather, you know, and and then we have this <clears throat> illegal or unconstitutional standing army that's taken the place of the militia <clears throat> and then in its stead, a campaign of ridiculing the militia. When the militia is the true source of power held with the people, not, and that being the monopoly of violence, not this standing army under control of the president himself. But when the militia 
is the people themselves, and then the the people vote directly for the sheriff. The sheriff heads the militia. Then you don't have the whole of the military underneath the president. So you have uh, power localized. You have first among peers, a sheriff elected by militiamen. So you have first among peers. It's not a high hierarchy with. You know, and and he's married. He's married directly to the people too, because he's not associated to a party. That's right. He's elected so, directly out of the people. Yeah, and, they, and it seems like the 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 uh, these malicious societies that we were talking about before had a similar structure, where it pretty much you could consider that everybody that was capable of of doing uh, doing battle were equal. So there's some degree of egalitarianism there. And, but you, you still need, uh, in any group, you need a subset that acts as agency. Somebody needs to direct and make decisions or, or be at least a final uh, point of resolution for decisions. So they elect first among peers. He's not better or he's not higher. He's just, he's, he's just elected. Out he of might have people. more experience. Yeah. Or you just know. be the one willing to take on responsibility. And yeah, it, it and, and the one the one that's gained the highest trust relationship. That's right. Yeah, of, and, of and, the local militia. Yeah, and if and if he's not doing his job well, then those peers remove him and put another first among peers in there. So, so, so it's this notion that you, we need a hierarchy. We're always going to have a hierarchy. We're always going to have Pareto distributions. But how do how do we live with those Pareto distributions so that they're not uh, they're not causing damage. Well, this was one way. You have you have people that have qualified by their ability, you know, as warriors, they've qualified for their ability to be the ones to make a choice to, uh, for the 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 leader of their warriors within their society, first among peers. Uh, so this notion of sheepdog democracy is that uh, that everybody within the society is an enforcer of natural law. Uh, and and that the power is not centralized within an institution like a police force or a military. It is literally dispersed to everybody. If if you are a citizen within that society, you are also a police officer. And not to get people upset over the word citizen, excuse Bill <laughs> yeah. for using that. <laughs> yeah. That uh, so so you know imagine being in a store and somebody tries to steal something and runs down the street, running away, trying to get away. Every person he'd be passing is a potential police officer. Right. Every person he's passing. Well, you know, and in the U.S., I'm not sure about Canada, but in the U.S., anyone, and most people don't even know this, anyone can put somebody under arrest. Yeah, and we can here too. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, is our police, police force has special rights. I'm sure yours have special rights. Ours definitely have They're special rights. They're technically not supposed to. They're supposed to be equal to the people, but of course so, they fudge those lines. So consider that everything that, that your police force has access to and is allowed to do is distributed to everybody within the society. Uh, you, would, you, would, you would start to see uh, a social investment and a social co cohesion like we haven't seen before. You know, and this is exactly how they circumvented the militia and this this social cohesion was to create an unlawful standing army, mm -hmm. which then goes around that, and then it becomes the monopoly of power, and then it gains more power than all of the people as a whole combined. Mm -hmm. And it's because because they they are the core of of the power behind a state, which is monopoly on force. So if we distribute the mon monopoly on force to the citizens uh, and anybody who's willing to take up that mantle or anybody that's in that opportunity that must be executed, you now have that mechanism that's required to keep a society functioning, being the monopoly on force. But what makes it a mon monopoly isn't an institution and it isn't a, you know, a, a certain hierarchical structure. It's simply the agreement to uphold natural law. That if, if, if we are all involved in enforcing natural law and we all in, in, in all of that, in that entire spectrum from not only your own behavior, but also enforcing it in other people, then we can start to have uh, a society that has uh, this uh, institutional stability that we see in societies today without 
you know, the fuckery that we see coming from the top down, right? Uh, so that's sheepdog democracy, the notion that every, that the law is simple enough, uh, and we can get into that law later, but it's simple enough to be able to, to interpret situations, to be able to give you some decidability on, on guilt or impositions and so on, uh, that anybody can apply it and then distribute the power to the population. Now you don't, it's not like, well, here's the power. It's you, you need to be a militiaman. You need to be armed. You need to be trained. You need, you need to be a threat. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, just, just common talking. sense when you look at it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and when that's distributed, then, then we can have a social cohesion. And what boggles my mind, you know, in this uh, event in, in Vegas, you, with all this now, everybody's screaming, oh, we got to take the guns away. How dare they? And so the, the propaganda is more than ever. And, um, you know, so they're, they're, you know, this is a key thing that they have to get away from us to, mm -hmm. you know, finally put the people down once and for all, because then there will be no means of fighting back. That's right. Well, and, and to what degree do we have a, 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 an ability to fight back? I mean, do, do you honestly think that the civilians can stand up and fight against a modern military force? No, oh, probably not. You know, you but I, I mean, at least drive it out for a few decades. But yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the asymmetry in force is ridiculous right now. You know, um, yeah, I had another thought, but I lost it. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's trying to clarify monopoly and violence. Now, let's look at the other thing that's been running through my mind is people have uh, sort of a p political slant that's that's highly built off of their, their own uh, personality traits. Personality traits tend to give us constellation of values and then one manifestation of those values is our political meaning. So if you look at, uh, say, anarchists, anarchists don't want any rulers at all because rulers are going to come and screw you over, right? But, but in taking that stance, there's no cohesion to a monopoly on violence. Right. And there's, no, there's no willingness to pay into that. And there's no uh, there's a suspicion that any kind of organization of that sort of thing is going to end up being uh, another state. Well, it would be another state. So you'd be in your your anarchist society and, you know, one person out of the two percent that are always screwing things up for everybody else robs from somebody else or does something crappy. And now you have to deal with it. Well, and then that happens a couple more times, and the people that end up dealing it end up being kind of a de facto law enforcement. Anyway. They, they they become the the sheriff and the posse, and That's then right. everything starts all over yeah. again. And then it's like, That's right. And then you're back into <laughs> something that resembles a state. It's just not called a state anymore. And in doing that, you also now don't have any of the checks and balance and constraints or any of the the lessons that we've learned over millennia of doing this. So you're you're going to you're you're going to have to have these things because they're they're necessary components for people to live together, which is all about human conflict, human cooperation, and so on. You know, and then you get libertarians that maybe they don't have too much of an issue with a police force or a military, but it's like don't aggress against me, man. Just you know, we can trade and do business, but you do what you want to do. I want to do what I want to do. Just leave me alone. So really all they're seeking is opportunity. They don't want their opportunity to, to be screwed around with. So they don't want regulations. They don't want to be inferred upon. It's like, if I'm not hurting you, I should be able to pursue my opportunities. But then within that, those opportunities live within an environment, live within a context. And that context includes a society and it includes uh, shared values. It includes a high trust circumstances for those opportunities to exist that they're not willing to pay for. So it's like, you know, if I'm selling porn, I'm not hurting anybody. All my actors agreed. They've all consented. It's all voluntary. The people that buy from me, it's all voluntary. I haven't aggressed against anybody. You should, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't have any right over what I'm doing, but they're not, paying attention to is the social impact that that has 
the impact it has on, on families, the impact it has on young male brains and so on that they don't want to be responsible for. They right. just want their opportunity. They just want the, the opportunity to, to extract wealth morally, but they don't want any of the other responsibility that goes along with that. They don't want the moral responsibility for the ramif- ramifications of selling pornography. Yeah. You know, and, 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 that- and just uh, really quickly, I wanted to mention for those – uh, who haven't seen it, uh, I've done a couple of shows with Gary Wilson on uh, the damage that pornography does and how addicting it is and the social ramifications of that. Mm-hmm. Spit that out. But uh, just to let people know if they want more research, they should definitely check that out. And that's only one example. Look at everything that you've looked at with the counterculture and the impact that that's had on society. Well, those are all social damages. Damage the social commons. Right. And there's no way to hold those people accountable. How, uh, how do you hold, you know, an organization like the CIA accountable for well, selling all of this stuff? And, and yeah, and and, and I want to talk about corporations a little bit later. Um, so so there's your your anarchists don't want any state, you know, just leave me alone. Right? And then the libertarians just want their opportunity. Don't interfere with my opportunity, but no responsibility. <clears throat> then you have people that all they're about is the social responsibility that everything is about social fabric, everything is about con- context, uh, and this is where our socialists come from, our left-leaning people. They're all about the social environment and nothing to do with the individual. And what they're denying is, is, is personal agency, that nobody is a, an active agent. There is no free will. You're just a, a result of your society, so we need to write policies to change the society to match my morals and my values because I'm right, you know? No, left. Yeah, or left, yeah. (laughs) In any of these cases, if you look back in society, any society we've had, we've always sort of had those three factions going on. People seeking commerce, seeking uh, people seeking status, people seeking subsidy. Because these are all uh, survival strategies. These are all ways that... uh, humans can survive. We can survive through predation. We can survive through cooperation or we can survive through parasitism. Well, you know, and and something you mentioned to me in a a message last week on Facebook was that this is the break. These three things are the breakdown of the political dynamics that we see out there today. Yeah. And and, and what what it boils down to is that they're the three most viable ways that a social creature can stay alive. Well, let's let's go through. You know, generally, women are going to be social. Yeah, they're going to be social, and, and, and there's good reason for it. They need to raise kids and nurture kids. They can't be going out getting resources. So they seek subsidy. They seek resources from the father or from the greater community, and they must. So it, it's a consumptive uh, strategy. They're all about consumption, and it's a, it's a short time horizon. I have to take care of my kid right now, and whatever the problems they are right now. So it's a short time horizon that's bent on consumption. Then you have uh, uh, sort of the young male strategy, which is that libertarian view, which is all about opportunity. And it's the opportunity really to, to rise in the hierarchy. You're that's a, that's a nice way of hierarchy. saying beta males. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, yeah. So the beta males that, that want the opportunity uh, to demonstrate that they they can be alpha, so they're all about the opportunity. So it's like you know, alpha, don't screw with me, but keep my opportunity for me to beat you be, out. Be an alpha, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's it's a way of trying to trying to get away from direct competition with the alpha. That's a that's tends to be they tend to be. Uh, and then the the alpha. Did you mention the the alpha tends to be the the conservative of the group? Yeah, it is the conservative. So the libertarian is is usually seeking transaction. So libertarian is beta seeking transaction. Yeah. Alpha, so, he's the conservative. He's already so, proven himself, and then. Yeah. And, and wants to continue to prove himself. So that's right. the thing. Is that Rather than where is the right. And then yeah. the and then the women tend to be socialist because they need that support being the child rears and whatnot. Yeah. And in the, the conservatives and, if, tend to be production uh, oriented, libertarians seem to be transaction oriented. So they're they're looking to, to, to benefit off the transaction, the movement of 
of, uh, of goods. And they're kind of, their thinking is, is mid range in terms of, let me, time. let me sell my heroin and my drugs legally, but not care about the ramifications it's, that those drugs have on society. That's right. So the, they'll tend to be a mid range sort of uh, decision making. They don't think two or three generations out. They don't think about, you know, the, the past three or four generations. That's where the conservatives come in. And the conservatives tend to have very long time horizons. Uh, they, uh, they're they all about protect and preserve. And, and because they have children and they're providing for the wives and the, and the children mm -hmm. <clears throat> as they yeah. should be. Yeah, and, and they also tend to be the ones that rise up the hierarchy. So they want to preserve the hierarchy even when the hierarchy is damaging. So you know what a Pareto distribution is. Pareto was the one that came up with the 80-20 rule, 80-20 observation. Okay. You know, so in business, it's 80% it's, uh, of your transactions will come from 20% of your, your clients. 80% uh, uh, of the features or 20% of the features in a piece of software are used 80% of the time. It's this natural distribution that comes up in everything. It comes up all over nature. So they call it a Pareto distribution. That is, it's, it's essentially a curve that, uh, thing, some things converge and they, and they tend to converge, uh, according to this distribution. Um, so for instance, so for an operational explanation of, of a Pareto distribution would be if, uh, if I manage to get a little wealth, say I invent something and I sell it and I get a little wealth. Now that I have this wealth, I've increased the likelihood that I'll get more wealth in the future because now I have money to invest. And then if I continue to do that, each time I engage in that, I increase the likelihood that I'll get more. So what happens is all of the wealth tends to gravitate towards very few people. Same thing with popularity. If you get a little bit of popularity through word of mouth and other people uh, you know, talking about you, you increase your likelihood of becoming more popular in the future. This happens all over nature where things like wealth and power tend to converge. Uh, other things tend to disperse. But with the Pareto, the Pareto distribution is always going to happen. And in a, a natural environment that rewards the capable, so you're not going to live unless you're capable of taking care of yourself, we always have a natural hierarchy. A hierarchy will always emerge. The issue is, is that we get to a point where those distributions um, you become so steep. Uh, the difference between the 1% and the rest of the population is so steep that uh, society starts to decay or there's not enough opportunities for young males to rise in the hierarchy. So they turn to crime. So all of these things, uh, humans as an animal, conservatives want to protect this hierarchy no matter what, even though it's damaging to the rest of society because that's how they got to where they are. So each one of these three has their positive and negative side to them. And what we're seeing in our political, political landscape is that same breakdown. So how, how do we have a social order that allows people that are very different uh, for everything from biological to sociological reasons, that we're always very different, how do we get people to get along so that, uh, you know, Subsidy seeking people don't turn to parasitism. Conservatives don't turn to predation. You know, libertarians don't turn to parasitism and so on. How do we keep people within these cooperative, this cooperative means? Because when, when you understand that, that breakdown, it becomes apparent that, for instance, when the LGBT crew or the SJWs are seeking special rights, Really what they're doing is they're discriminating against other survival strategies within, within the society, saying that only trying to use the rule of law to uh, make the only survival strategy that's legitimate their own. So it's only a socialist mentality that's legitimate. We have to get rid of the capitalists. We have to get rid of uh, the productive uh, groups, right, and the, the natural leaders and so on. The natural reproducers, for that yeah. matter, that even create the, themselves and the society to begin with. That's right. So what we're talking about now is not a system that we all operate within. What we're talking about is an ecology, an ecology where all of these parts need to be at play 
uh, and they, they need to have some degree of equilibrium. And when they come out of equi equilibrium, you know, so for instance, when we have a system that, that is conducive to, to parasitism, but not predation, then things fall out of balance. And then that's where we see these rising societies, this parasitic behavior, this, these atrocities and stuff emerge, right? It's all about maintaining that ecology. And the notion of sheepdog democracy and the democracy being based on, on agency, that it's, it's no impositions upon the agency of another or the conditions to develop agency. It, it means that the only, the, the only tolerable human interaction that we can have is one that's reciprocity. It's based on reciprocity. So any input that you've put in has to have an, uh, an equal return. So that one person isn't benefiting by lying or by manipulating or another person isn't stealing. That the name of the game is to always maintain this reciprocity. When we have that, these three groups that are very different, that also map against the classes, they map against demographics and so on, can live together. It's the, it's the, it's the one rule that allows a person that's interested in the social commons and wanting to help the poor do so without doing it at the cost of everybody else or uh, a conservative wanting to rise up and in, into leadership and produce and, 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 and create social commons do so without that being predation on everybody else. Right. Right. Or libertarians do so without these long-term consequences that are, that are never acknowledged. Well, the way that we do that is that we ensure that all interactions between all of us maintain this reciprocity. If it doesn't maintain that reciprocity, there's been a cost imposed somewhere, a damage imposed somewhere that we can assess and we can decide what to do about. So that's one, it's just one law that, uh, you know, your mining business in Northern Ontario dumping heavy metals into the thousand lakes that are in the Canadian shield is a social imposition and a cost that needs to be paid for, right? That's not a socialist thing to say. Uh, you know, but at the same time to say, get out of people's way and let them do business and no, you don't have a right to people's hard earned money. It is not a, a neocon thing to say either. It's true. If you start taking, extracting people's labor from them and their wealth from them, they're going to resent it and they're going to build systems to circumvent what you're doing and vice versa. So how can we, how can we maintain this ecology uh, uh, without it, without it turning into these class wars or these political ideological wars and so on well you come to a common ground which is don't fuck with my life i won't fuck with your life and and don't fuck up everybody else's chance to develop a life so don't impose on me <laughs> don't impose on the social commons and this is this is the whole notion that you know comes back to everybody needs to be armed everybody needs to be able to protect themselves it's that meekness again Yes. Uh, understanding that, you know, I am capable of using violence to put down violence against me, mm -hmm. but I am not going to go out and seek violence. I am not the wolf. That's I am right. the sheepdog, you know, yeah. and then we have a duty to protect the sheep. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the sheep, if they're not able to protect themselves or willing, need to pay for that protection. They, they need to right but you know and at the same time though they need to recognize and not turn into little communists and feed off of the rest of the system they need to recognize somehow that they are the sheep right and if they don't want to be sheep then get trained get armed you know you're you're capable well and and that go you know and that's just again that goes back to the whole issue of leveling the playing field with arms by, you know, trying to get everybody the trivium method, et cetera, just so that, you know, and of course, you know, there's higher philosophies and everything, but that gives everybody the, the foundation to understand and see and protect themselves physically and mentally. Yeah. Now, so it talks about that we've, we've done a pretty good job of dealing with predation in our societies. There's not a, a a lot of physical violence uh, as a way of coercion for the vast major majority of people. I know it does happen more so uh, in the States than here in Canada, but for the most part, we can walk down the street without, you know, worrying about roving gangs of, of, of warlords and stuff. 
we haven't dealt with parasitism I was talking about. So this introduces well, in, in Canada is uh, you know one of the world leaders now in parasitism along with <laughs> yeah, the UK yeah. and China yeah. and yeah. Uh, it's uh, I often say that Canada isn't a country, it's a kiosk where they sell off natural resources at the lowest price. Um, yeah, uh, the, the notion of parasitism now goes back to this notion of truthfulness uh, and testimonialism, that when you do not speak truthfully, you're imposing a cost on the informational commons that other people have to pay. So we were, uh, had a conversation with somebody on Facebook and uh, they weren't willing to look at the facts. It's the typical story, weren't willing to look at the facts and so on. Uh, and then griped about you being rude. I'm saying, so my statement to that was that when you don't check into your opinions and you assert them as fact, you force other people to have to check them for you or to clear the record or they go out on your word, act on that information, which would be disastrous if you were wrong, and that you have a responsibility for that damage. Well, that well, well yeah, you know, and it's, you know, when it's, when somebody asks you a question, if you don't have the answer and if you haven't researched it, you need to have the integrity to stand up and say, I don't know. I yeah, haven't or, looked into that. Or I only know this. I'm not aware of anything else. Right. So, so, that, so that's one vector for truthful speech is, is a full accounting, including a full accounting of, of the work that you've done and the knowledge that you have. You know, so uh, uh, it's, it's the, the, the presupposition behind this is that truth isn't so much something that we can apprehend out there as much as it is uh, the absence of error. What truth is, is the absence of error. Uh, and that opens up to the idea that then what we do know right now is provisional. It's it's uh, open to be updated with new evidence in the future. So it's, you know, and it's, it's understanding that truth is the lack of contradiction. Yeah. It's the and absence of a absence of contradiction. Yeah. And there's all there's all of these vectors that we can we can measure truthfulness based on. Uh, so if we were to just look at the trivium alone, so we would say that it, it the grammar has to be correct. So it has to be a fact. You have to say that it's internally consistent. So the logic is correct. Uh, give me some others. What else? Well, we, we need to... Lacks um, contradiction, which is internal consistency. Sure. And then, and then make sure that the presentation and the rhetoric is accurate along so full with... Uh, full accounting along with the grammar and the logic. Okay. You know, but but it it's a it's a it's a it it has a feedback loop built into itself. You know, mm -hmm. because it should always be seeking out errors. You know, if any new information comes in, you don't presume to know the information mm -hmm. until you've checked it and and compared it to the grammar that you've already gone through and the logic that you've already gone through. If you do find an error, then you can update it. But if you've checked it properly in the past, it can either typically be disregarded or it should be able to fit right into the one of the existing categories. Right. But that's only three vectors. That's only three criteria that we're going on. Right. right? So all, all we're saying is it has to be fact-based, so it has to be grounded in reality somewhere. Our thinking about it has to be internally consistent, so it has to be logical, and we have to have a full, full account of it. What about existential consistency is is your understanding of it operationally correct is it actually real and how is it real so that's another vector right if you're dealing with sociological systems is it morally consistent? right when, when it when it plays out in, in society is yeah, it going so to it operate is. is it going to create social tension mm -hmm. and social degradation and mm -hmm. then and then what's next uh, well, I mean, what else is left? Social degradation, you know, is, 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 is pretty much the end all of all of it, right? So it's this notion that and this if, criteria, if, we, can, we, can, we can elevate this from a criteria of two or three things. And for the most part in philosophy, it's only really two things. It's grammar and logic. And if you're a Platonist and a rationalist, it's only, it's only internal consistency. So there's only one criteria. We can raise that criteria to about seven different things. 
Now, if you can, if you can argue a case and make and made up against all seven of, of those check boxes, then you can claim to speak truthfully because you've done the due diligence to check off every possible area can you, that, that you can, you can fail at. So is it falsifiable? Is it parsimonious? Are you, are you overloading it by bringing in a bunch of facts that may or may not be relevant uh, or, or do you not have enough facts? So there's, there's all of these criteria that we can add in to ensure that we're not getting it wrong, that we're not falling for our own bias, we're not uh, being deceitful, it makes it impossible to be deceitful. Well, if we had this notion, testimonialism or something along that lines, uh, as, a social uh, as a social value that was legally enforceable, parasitism wouldn't be possible because parasitism relies on informational ma manipulation. I thought you would like that. <laughs> I do like that. And it's, uh, well, you know, there's, you know, there's so many ways we can go with that because, you know, that's what we've been exposing on the show for the last six years is this, this, uh, social manipulation and parasitism that's right. And, and it, you know, and it, getting people to think they're free because of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Right. Right. Or even just just things like bad nutritional uh, information. Right. Uh, very few people know about the, the ramifications of chemical stents and cardiovascular disease uh, and and how high carb diets contribute to that. Well, how many people have died since the 80s based on that advice? Well, that is a real cost. we'll go back even further, you know, and when they introduced vegetable oil in the 1910s and when they intro introduced Crisco and all of this stuff, and these, these parasites told people, don't eat lard, don't eat your bacon grease, don't eat that stuff. That stuff's bad, even though you're all healthy and there's no disease. Mm -hmm. And you need to eat our vegetable oils and then eat our margarine and eat these toxic trans fats. And by the way, meat is the cause of the disease. So eat more grains, which cause the disease, coupling with the vegetable oils. And now the lack of vitamin K2 from not having enough meat and eggs. Mm -hmm. And then you have all of these people dying. But if you go all the way that far back, you can see that it was an agenda and they created a sick industry out of it. And then and they, they did it because we have no defense against parasitism. They, we have no defense against parasitism, and people didn't have the critical thinking, the the logic to go through and see how they had flipped using Kabbalistic inversion, flipped everything backward, and mm -hmm. told people the exact opposite. You know, if you eat more whole grains and more legumes, you're going to be healthier and healthier and healthier. And meanwhile, people are fatter and fatter, and that's because the inflammation from all of the lectins and these things uh, goes through the roof, and then they don't have enough fat in their diet to, to fight it, and mm -hmm. then their system shuts down. You know, it's like this guy that I started off reading the uh, or uh, talking about that went from 569 pounds down to, you know, he said he hit 380 and then went back up, but... You know, here's a knock at him. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be consistent with reality. If you know something is a lie, you have to stop lying to yourself because, you know, it's not just grammar, logic, rhetoric. It's mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. It's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. All mm -hmm. of these things combined. But when you're consistent with reality that and stop lying to yourself that these things are okay for you to put in your body, you will heal. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's and it's if you if we're consistent with the with the application of this stuff on society, it will heal. And when people are pushing this stuff at us, it's a violation of natural law. All of it on each level. And, and the, you know, it's just microcosms of these of these macrocosms. And it's like we just need to see each one and unlock it and understand it so that we can, you know, approach it head on. You know, do you think that uh, we stand a chance at uh, pulling this off before they cube the, the world, before they enslave us all? Uh, like I said, I, I go back and forth um, on, on the, not only the notion of, of uh, reversing it, but 
maybe actually forcefully changing it. And I'm not hopeful on that front. Um, so I, you know, I don't think we can rise up and change it, but I go back and forth. I think that, well, whether it's hopeless or not, we still need to. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's like when you're hopeless and backed into the corner, that's when you're <laughs> most likely to lash it, out. It's, it's, it's <laughs> need to be done. So am I just being a libertarian by saying that and, and backing away yeah. from it? Well, yeah, be um, careful calling you. I mean, you know, the thing with the libertarians <laughs> is even their logo is a is a serpent, you know. Yeah, and and then the other notion is uh, is maybe we can change it slowly, get back into the institutions, make changes. Don't think that's even possible. There's there's uh, the system is too entrenched to a to a particular survival strategy now. So well, what, well, what we, it seems like what we have to do is figure out a way to attack parasitism first and foremost, right? That's right, and that's the that's the crux of the whole thing. And, and then, that's Marxism, communism, Zionism. Well, it's lying in any form. It's lying yeah. and getting things wrong in any form. But you know, when we've it's, talked, yeah, to the past it went when, when it's like this. that that quote. I don't know. I I could never source it, but Gene thought it came from uh, the Buddha, possibly, but. When only one remains ignorant amongst us, they bring the whole of the world down with them. Yeah. So this is why I focus on remnant, because every other possible outcome, say we fight and we die, we infiltrate and succeed, or we fight and survive. In any of these, these situations, we still must have a remnant. We must always be working in a remnant, whether it's peaceful time, when there's no threat, when there is a threat, when there is a decline. We, um, we out, we've outsourced our social fabric to academics and politicians. And, and we've conflated the notion of society with our government. Uh, we've conflated the notion of culture with our entertainment systems. We need to take it back. We need to deconflate those, take it and say, it's mine. I have to take responsibility for it. And then maintain that, maintain a, uh, you know, educating our kids on holding that with a strong conviction. Because no matter what the scenario, a remnant must be present. The, the backbone has to be there. And it, it has to always be there. And, we and, and well, but what's interesting is natural law, that backbone is always there. They can try and hide it and cover it up, but it always seems to percolate back up. Yeah, I mean, and essentially what it comes down to is that when we see something that's unjust and pisses us off, unless we're seeking an advantage and lying to ourselves we're seeing natural law being broken. So that goes back again to that notion of testimonialism and truthfulness is that you can think that you're right about something and under it, really all you're doing is seeking your own survival strategy. So you have to get rid of your own bias and your own deceit and see through that uh, before you can see the truth or else you're just participating in the nonsense that's breaking that natural law. Now, uh, let's see, in between you and you in the last couple of weeks, uh, we had Clint Richardson on. Yeah. And of course, uh, you uh, said woof in the audience last week about uh, doing a show with Clint and getting into this. But, uh, you know, some friends and I, and I've got, uh, you know, one sitting down here, I've got a 1611 Bible sitting here. But, uh, We've been going through, what do you think about Clint's notion? And he was the first one that pointed it out to me, but it's also not very original. I posted a video on, uh, on Facebook yesterday of a, a Christian group pointing out, and Clint pointing out, that the Bible is actually natural law, especially the New Testament. But we've been going through it, and uh, you know, I've been astounded at how much is actually natural law when you take it out of the context of, of religion and these deities, you know, and it's like, you know, it doesn't matter if Jesus was real or not. That's that misses the whole point of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it, the whole thing is about what you were just saying, truthful testimony, you know, standing in truth. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a whole section in there. What is it? John 10 about, you know, being the shepherd for all the sheep, you know, mm -hmm. You know, so it's like these concepts are all in there, but it's been, uh, you know, they've they've twisted it into arguing over where the, whether these characters were real or not or historical or not. 
and they've gotten away from the whole point, I think, of what it what it really is, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it, it's interesting because when you read in the past, people would say, well, if you were a Christian, you could not be enslaved. And I think that's because originally the idea was, you know, in my mind, from what I've studied of it, you, there's this, the, the story is about this hero character, and he, his name is Jesus, and he's figured out this natural law stuff and truth, and that there are no contradictions in nature. And he can see all the crap, and he goes around, and he calls people out, and then they're like, you know, we got to shut that guy up, and he's like going around telling everybody how to do it. Right. And then uh, at the end of the story, they kill him. And then, you know, it's all about the moral of the story. But every point he makes is about natural law. Mm -hmm. And then directly after that, a comment about truth. And then he's right. talking about how, you know, you know, and in the trivium, Gino Denning used to talk about how truth in the center was subverted with God or do. So if you get that truth and God are the same are synonymous, then he's just saying, I'm in truth. And then it's like, you know, forget these beings and all of this stuff. Just realize it's a hero story and he's talking about truth. Yeah. And tell the truth. Tell, you know, uh, he says, you know, don't don't slander, you know, don't uh, do your buddy's wife. Don't do all of this kind of stuff. Act in natural law. Don't cause commotion in society. Uh -huh. So I think if, you know, I, anyway, I just wanted to get your feedback on what you think of understanding the Bible as natural law and getting away from the concept of it as religion. Well, and I think it's a brilliant idea. And I, and I would also suspect that you could probably look at other, find other historical documents and find, find natural law in there. I, I would agree with that. You know, it's just, I think, you know, reading it and going through it recently with the understanding that Clint's brought about, you know, looking at it at natural law, you know, it's like, no wonder why it was the greatest story ever told, because it was about natural law and finding truth, mm -hmm. you know, not about beings, not about, you know, here's a thing that I realized uh, going through this constantly is, you know, the, the concept of Jesus raising the dead, in my opinion, and I know this is going to upset a lot of people out there, wasn't about physically raising people from the dead. He's talking about deadheads waking people up you know it's like hello you know hey man and i i was given this thing over here on a sabbath day but i woke this dude up so you're gonna tell me it's bad because i woke this guy up you know mm -hmm. and i did work on the sabbath oh but this guy woke up he's no longer dead he's uh, in the living now he got it you know yeah. so you know so it's just i think if if people got away from the you know and i think it was done intentionally is to get people to focus on arguing whether Daffy Duck is real or not. I, sorry, I mean, Jesus is real or not. Instead of understanding Daffy Duck's story or, or the story, the hero story yeah. that Jesus is putting forth. And, you know, we talked about heroes in the last episode. And, you know, it's like when you get that Jesus is the hero and just laying the stuff out and he can see everybody's crap and he's exposing it and he's like, you know, the the users at the temple, this stuff is out. You know, that's against natural law. This is against natural law, et cetera, et cetera. It's, mm -hmm. you know, to me, it's all right there. You know how I teach my my daughter about God? Because my, my mother-in-law, her nana is, is quite religious, and, and she participates in the church with her nana a lot. So I didn't want to be, you know, pounding atheism into her head or, or deism or anything else operationally the only the only evidence that we can find of god that isn't explained some some other way is that it's a belief within humans now for something to exist it means that something has to be measurable it has to have an impact of some sort that we can measure well when people have a belief in god their behavior changes and that impacts the world and that's a measurable change which means that god exists that means that God exists, and we right. know God exists through the behavior of people. Here's here's something, you know, this goes, to, and this is going to go on another line of thought. It's like like I was just saying, and like Gene Oden, Odenning taught me many times, I was just, this is my, my new 1611, I just got to go as far back into it as I could, but 
is the idea that if we stop thinking of God as just God, this word, and think of it as logos uh-huh. or the word or truth, uh-huh. then the whole perception changes. Because when we consider God as logos, and then logos is in action, all, anything that ever was, is, or could be, then we solve the problem of the noun, we solve the problem of the verb, yeah. and then we have consistency. But it's, you know, it's, it's also saying, you know, there is a natural law here. Well, if you're going to measure gods now, let's say, okay, so a god exists through the the, uh, the effects that its believer has. So we're, I'm going off god as being a noun now. Now we have a way of assessing which gods are good or bad. Well, <laughs> but here's here's the thing is if god is truth yeah, and only truth, only with, the word, which, only which the is, logos, then it always is consistent with nature. Which is consistent with nature and always brings it back to natural law. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking about false gods, well, let's look at the, uh, look at the impact that believers of other gods have. Which is the why they were called false versus, gods, because they weren't seeking truth, right? Right. So, so now you get, it, you get into something that now you can assess those, those belief systems, those gods, based on the impact that it has on its, on its world through its believers. Right, and that that was a notion uh, after we did the meditation uh, uh, video. Uh, I was researching the social impact that Buddhism had versus other religions, and it's it's I think it's underrepresented by four percent or something like that. But the one that was off the charts was Protestant Christians. Protestant Christians were less than thirty percent of the of the world's population but account for almost 70% of the NGOs across the world. And then it's like that, no matter how scientific or materialistic or skeptical you want to be, that's something you can't ignore. Yeah. That's a whole lot of people that are doing a whole lot of good work in their communities based on a belief system, whether, whether we want it verified uh, by our criteria or not, that impacts real. We shouldn't ignore that. Well, how do you how do you get people believing these things without maybe meeting our criteria that can have such a, a positive impact? Well, the beliefs must align in a way that allows it to have a positive impact on the world, which would mean that it aligns with nature somehow, right? Right. So, if you're talking about Buddhist gods being protectors of the path and all of that nonsense, how does the belief in that deity have any impact on the world at all? Well, it doesn't. If anything, it just takes your mind out of it. But if you're believing in a Christ story that is a hero that's pointing a way on how to behave, that has a positive impact on you and the people around you. That's, that's so that's well, it. you know, and just to drive this point home, and I've never done this before, ladies and gentlemen, I am actually, forgive me, Bill, I'm going to read live from the, from the 1611 King James Bible. But this is John uh, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word and, and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay, so that's just, you know, it's logos. Mm-hmm. It's the word, you know, and the original word was logos. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him, so made by the word or the logos, and not anything made that uh uh and was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men in other words not the dark the light the light the you know the the path of truth and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness darkness comprehended it not so the lies couldn't understand the truth And uh, let's see, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and the same came from a witness who bear witness. Okay, so here we go, bearing witness, the word, the truth, bearing witness, all right here in the the, the beginning of John, that all men thought him uh, might believe. And he was, uh, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light, to bear witness of truth. 
that and and here it and here it confirms that interpretation that was the true light which was uh lighting every man that cometh into the world you know and so when you go through and you just think of these concepts as truth word logos natural law wash and repeat suddenly you know it's not this contradictory story of this guy you know walking on water and raising the physical dead he's waking up deadheads you know mm -hmm. he's like saying come on dummies come on wake up you're asleep wake up you know and hey man i woke this guy up today man check it out guys listen to this story he got it he got bill's analysis of natural law Woo -hoo! <laughs> yeah. that's very cool so anyway that was a gnostic media first <laughs> Mark the date. <laughs> <laughs> 10 10 2017. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, what I want to do is maybe in the next week or two have you on with Clint. Are you down for, uh, with that as soon as we get that organized? Yeah, I think so. I think that, like I said, that I'm, I'm coming from very, a very different angle. But we're coming to similar conclusions, at least how to be in the world and, and what, what the world needs. Um, so there's got to be something there, right? If you're coming at things from different angles like that and they're cross-verifying, I think it's worth a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, because if it's natural law, that's what should always be happening as we're arriving at these conclusions, even if we're looking at them from different spokes on the wheel. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's just it's a matter of clarifying, clarifying that definition of what natural law is so that it's it's not subject to interpretation and overloading and deception and error and bias and all that other stuff. So that we know it in, tr in a truthful way. All right, so uh, let's see here. Thanks to Hamish for making a donation today, and uh, thanks to anybody. I haven't gone to the website or to the email to check yet. If you made a donation today, please support the show, GnosticMedia.com. Please throw Bill some donations for, for all of his hard work and study to bring all of this out. And, no, uh, I work for a living. You don't have to give me donations. <laughs> you can give me feedback. That helps. Right? Well, <laughs> you could probably use donations sometimes too to help out, yeah. but uh, you know it's always uh, anyway good to support you and uh, thanks for coming on, Bill. And uh, have anything else you want to add before we part? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm a little tired today. I was working a little late, so I'm a, feel a bit off my game. So if anybody's noticed that, I apologize. But well, they do now because you mentioned it. <laughs> okay. All right, man. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks. See you next week. Take care, and until next time. Take care.